the New York metro area's most eclectic radio station. You're listening to WFDU, Tina. 89.1. They're playing basketball. We love that basketball. Hello, They're and welcome back basketball. to my team of listeners. It's the Greg Horrenda Show. Sunday morning, Kenny. That's right. We got a big day ahead of us. And, you know, I'm going to run into you. I'm going to try. This is our annual Jet game. The boys from the 79th Street Courts in North Bergen. Vidge, Vinny, Pete, Daly, and Horrenda are getting together. And we're going to cook it out, spark it up, and hopefully cheer on our Jets. To a victory over the Bills. I think we got a good shot this week. Percy Harvin. It, it's gonna, there's going to be a buzz in the building with Percy. We haven't been home in a while. We need a win, and I just think it's going to be the, the, the rain is stopping, thank God, and it's going to be a beautiful day. My son's coming, Trey. Vidge's son, Sammy. I know I'm dropping local names, but I'm just and I love going to games – and I can just be a total fan. Yeah. I'll put a you know baseball hat on. No one knows who I am. I can scream at the refs. I can scream at Rex. If we do something good, I cheer. Um, it's just like being a fan. And a lot of times as a coach, when I go to high school games or so forth and so on, I've got to be Johnny the coach, you know, and just be politically correct and just be, you know, kind of a nerd. I, I want to be a fan on Sunday. I want to cheer my Jets on. Uh, to a much-needed victory. Are you going to be wearing a jersey? Are you going to be wearing any green? I, I've got a T-shirt that I think I'm going to throw on over like a long sleeve. I think that's the look that yeah. I, I've got. I'm not into the big Testaverde <laughs> jersey or the – I'm not a jersey jersey guy. I'm like a low-key uh, you know, fan, so I'm not, I, I'm not buying a jersey. To change the tune here for a second, I'm yeah. rooting for my players academically every day. Absolutely. And the more we see uh, and hear about this North Carolina you know, paper class, Rashad McCant, Roy Williams, football, basketball, it, it's sad because right now the easy way out, and I'm not casting any aspersions, but I just know at Fairleigh Dickinson University, there are no paper classes. No. This is a blue-collar, great, undervalued, and underestimated education you get here. My, I know every class that my players are in. We break up our players' academics per coach, and I oversee everything along with my academic advisor, Jen Quirk. And what's going on in Carolina um, is really alarming what happens with athletes, and I was an athlete, is the first thing, and this is probably the lowest barometer or bar, is eligibility. These guys and gals have to be eligible to play, so you have an incumbent, you have a reason to go to class so you can get on the floor. Yeah. Where other students, if things aren't going well and they're not doing good, the consequences, they have a bad semester and no one in the world knows. If you are not eligible and you can't step foot on the floor, now it's a public, it's, it's huge. But we have, you know, academic advisors, we have tutors, we have professors, and the, the line right now is different. When I was an assistant coach, say at Merrimack College, I would play squash with professors, and I kind of informally would be able to talk to them, and if a kid was having trouble, he would let me know. Now... There's a fine line between athletics and academics, which makes it more difficult because now you're finding out at midterms that there's a problem. So there's, there's a delineation that, whether that's good or bad, but um, you cannot, as a university, let young people take courses that you don't have to show up for because it just adds to the entitlement of the student-athlete. And it's a really, really scary situation where – uh, we'll follow it more. You know, people have lost their jobs, and Rashad McCants is, I think he's a little bit out of line after the fact, you know, tattletaling uh, on himself. He had some accountability as well. Uh, we've got the World Series, which I love Kansas City, and I'm so down. I'm so down on everybody talking about the ratings and that it's, 
Kansas City lost the first game of the World Series and you thought it was over. Then they bounce back. There's almost a, a Pier 9 brawl on the field. Now, you know, the, the, the series is back. And Kansas City's a small market. Yeah. And San Francisco's a long way away from New York and Chicago and Boston. So people, I'm, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a, it's the World Series. It doesn't seem people care about it anymore. I mean, and, and next year, you know, new commissioner, they might make some rule changes, speed the game up, but baseball yeah. has some issues where it's not a TV-friendly game anymore. It's and not. People, it's not appointment television anymore like it used to be. My son can't watch the game because it's starting, you know, 8, 8.30, and then by the time it's crunch time, it's, you know, 20 to 12, and my wife wants me to turn the TV off next to her. There's got to be a, There's got to be a better way, but it's still, it's baseball. Okay, I like this. Take me out to the ball game. <laughs> Come on, man. This is America. We can't let this. We can't let the past time go past us. No. Next week, we're gonna have Gary Puccio, our baseball coach, on with a special guest, and that special guest was a major league manager. So do some thinking and go out and support our pastime. Take me out to the ball. We'll be back with Tim Capstraw from the Brooklyn Nets. Peace. What's up, New Jersey? This is George Carl. Used to coach the Denver Nuggets in the NBA. Listen to Coach Horenda on Sundays and learn something about college basketball. Welcome back. Welcome back to my team of listeners. Welcome back, Coach Tim Capstraw, formerly of the Wagner. What's the Wagner nickname, Tim? The Seahawks. The Seahawks. They beat us. They beat us last year two times. I do not want to remember the Seahawk name, but I do want to welcome you and remember your name, Tim Capstraw was the 1993 Coach of the Year. And the same year, Kenny, he was also the Good Guy Award winner for the Metropolitan Sports Writer. And so apropos, Tim Capstraw, if anyone in the Metropolitan area knows him, is not only a good guy, but a great guy. So we welcome you back, Tim, to Northeast Conference Basketball, Northeast Conference Talk Radio. Welcome to the Greg Horrenda Show. Oh, I am uh, thrilled to be on this show. I've heard a lot of good things about it, and I am pumped up. And I'm looking on the website right now, and I see the fan poll. You get to vote on who your favorite (laughs) guest is, Steve Clifford, Jay Wright, Jim Calhoun, John Sterling. I'm going to get my name up there, and I'm going to look to blow those people away right now. Well, baby. you know what? That's, a, that's the kind of guy you are. You are a competitor. You are, <laughs> you are a, a hard-nosed player. You are a, right. a very, very good coach in this league. You, you are as fiery as anybody in practice, and now you've turned into this really nice, skinny, good-looking Guy, what like what happened, man? I remember when you were just you and Mike Dean were going up and down the sidelines, and uh, how do you how do you feel being out of coaching and being out of the practice gym, uh, at least without the whistle around your neck, Tim? How, how does that feel? Do you miss it? Well, I, I do miss it at times, and I think you always do. And, and yet, I was I've been so fortunate to be able to uh, broadcast uh, Northeast Conference games. Other, others, a few other conferences here and there, some NBA TV, and then the Brooklyn Nets. This opportunity for broadcasting really softened the blow. Now, it was a when you get fired from a job, it takes mm-hmm. it, it hurts you because you yep. know it's coming too. You know, it's not only after the fact; it's the year leading up to it that yep. you know you're gone yes. <laughs> if you don't win a certain amount of games, yep. and you don't even. I'm the only guy in America that thinks he deserved to be fired. I really did. This. No, 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 honestly. Yeah. I walked in, I got to tell you. Sure. After we had won 11 games for like the, the ninth year in a row, it's all right. like, I walked into Walt Hamline, the, the athletic director at, at Wagner College, said, sure. you got to fire me, don't you? And he goes, <laughs> yeah, I got to. Because I knew it was hard for him. We were very close. Yep. And he had told me before the year, please win this certain amount of games. Right. And so I can keep you. 
And I know I didn't, and so I made it easy. We ended up sitting down. We made a list of replacements. This wow. is all when I'm getting fired. Wow. We put yeah. the, uh, a list together. So I, I, I You, you might have been too good of a guy. No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. He gave me an extra year. I was like the <laughs> no, guy at the party. I, that, I was like the guy at the party that wouldn't leave. You know? <laughs> The well, lights were on. It was 4 in the morning. Just leave, <laughs> will you? That's what Wagner was thinking. He's a nice guy, yeah. but we had had enough. But it was hard yep. the last couple of years, and then uh, for but, a while. But you were right on the brink. I remember the game, and I don't want to bring back bad no. memories. It's the one thing I don't want to do. But right. the, I think it was at the Ryder game. Can you go back to that game in that moment and just tell the uh, our listeners what happened and just the significance of one or two plays in a coach's career? Well, absolutely, and, and that is a great point. I think it was 1993, and, and I think the conference calls it the greatest play in the history of the conference. It was incredible. Uh, and it was, we were, it was championship week. Yep. It was 9 o'clock on a Tuesday night the game began. It was, it was right when championship week just began. And this game was so enjoyable to people. It was at Ryder. It was mobbed. It was crazy. Oh, I remember it. I and remember it was it. a high school gym kind of nut sure. atmosphere. So the people showed us the ratings after the game, and it was like as high as they had been. It was on uh, regular ESPN, yep. and it was, you know, for this conference, as high as it could ever be. But anyways, uh, we had a terrific player named Bobby Hobson who made a big oh, basket yeah. with mm-hmm. four seconds remaining right. uh, in the game. We're up one point, and Ryder calls timeout. They have to go full court. Gotcha. And they line up, and we're we're getting all cute, and we're we're getting all set up. I have a big guy, Brendan Kenny, on the basketball, six yeah. ten guy, waving his hands, waving his oh, hands. That's a, good, that's a good coaching move, right there. Well, let's, there's, 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 there's a story Put somebody on, on the ball. From that. Okay, Kevin Bannon calls timeout. So gotcha. I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know, maybe I could get burned over the top with some kind of home run pass, right? I'm going to take this guy off and overcoach right now okay. and put this guy all the way back at, in the three-second lane as gotcha. a safety precaution. A la Christian Leitner. Yep. Exactly. But the, Derek Suber gets the ball oh. on the run, proceeds to take three quick dribbles. The, the initial pass is the key in that situation, right? Exactly. He not only got it pretty far off the floor, he got it with forward momentum. He was going downhill. I remember it. Downhill. And he ends up making. I don't. Even, it wasn't oh. even a three. You know, no. I, was, I don't think there was a three. Then it was. Mm-hmm. It was a two from about seventeen feet, where everybody's being cautious because nobody wants Going to foul. Yeah, sure. The place goes nuts, and I am just getting hammered the next day. Like I never. Mike and the Mad Dog was a big deal back then. I, right. I, I can tell you that myself and Wagner College were not prime time people on the show. You know right, what I mean? Right. It, it didn't come up that often. <laughs> well. Yep. Well, Mad Dog just totally destroyed me. Oh my God! And, and yep. you know, I when I and I'm trying to. I, I, for, first of all, they said, "Would you ever do that again?" Of course, I wouldn't. You know what right. I mean? Knucklehead, I would never do right. that again. Right, right, right. Then in '96, you see Patino do the same thing <laughs> exactly with Exactly the same thing. So forever and ever, please put a biggest person on the basketball, even on side out of bounds. I see that in the NBA a lot right sure. now. Yep. When it's late in the game and the side out of bounds, if you can angle your big man at about six, you know, six eight, six nine guy, sure. and make sure the pass doesn't go forward, right? You can really do yourself a lot, a lot of good. But that one play, um, well, then it, and in those days and in that game, you know, that's your ticket. You know, Suber misses the shot, or right. you know, they travel, or it's after the buzzer. Now Tim Capshaw, you know. He's involved with bigger jobs, and now your career goes into t- – and, and you never know for better or for worse. And I no, think- no, 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 you never know. And then about a month or two later, we had one player who was a sophomore, clearly the best player in the league, Yugoslavian player named Misha Mutadzic at 6'10", yep. or 6'11", okay. was a dominating player. I got him – I had four Yugoslavians on my, play, uh, on my team – uh, the war was going on in Yugoslavia. It's kind of not really. A, I don't want to joke about it, but sure. I kind of got them because they didn't want to go into the war. You exactly. Know? Yeah. It was, uh, uh, you know, and, and a great recruiting by me. But that's it's exactly not. how it worked. Yeah. And two months after that, I get a call from Dale Brown at LSU, sure, telling me that uh, Misha Mutadzic had contacted him and he wants to transfer. Wow. Well, amazing thing about Dale Brown is. 
by the end of the conversation, I wanted to go to LSU too. He had me so pumped up. <laughs> I was calling to break my heart. Yeah. Break my heart. By the end of it, this guy was talking the a mile preach, a minute. I said, the preacher. How can I join? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? Maybe you should have went. No, I should have went. You know what happened, though? <laughs> the night, my, my wife was a graduate of Ryder, uh, Ryder College at the time. Yep. And she, I met her a few years later after the game where Super made the shot, and she was at that game oh and remembered me. Well, and that's how we got to well, our, our conversation started. And a, and a guy named Todd the, Kowalczyk, who you know. I know Todd Toledo well. Right now, sure. Yep. Uh, introduced us, and then uh, the rest is history. So there's, I might have lost that game, but I gained a wife. There's so a really the silver line. That's why you're the good guy of the year, man. You found in, in, in a really tough spot, you found the love of your life. And not, not many people can do that. Uh, Oh, I know, and nobody believes it's my wife because she's you know younger than me and oh. she's real pretty and like people can't they like look at me like how'd you pull that off? I said I don't know, and it's I, my you know, and it was, it was like my first wife too. It's not like one of these trade-in jobs, you know. I'm in the same boat. We're both yeah, born. Wait a second, I saw pictures on your desk. Yes, I don't know how you did that? She's tough. We we over recruited. We married oh, up. up, and you know what oh. it was? It was the year of 1961. We were both born. In 1961, Jay Wright was born in 1961, so it was. I think it was a good year for for coaches. But now you to do the transfer and go to the radio to go to the NBA. I asked you this the other day at the NEC Social Media Day. Now you're critiquing. You know, Mad Dog jumped on you for for that game against Ryder. Now you're critiquing. Tim, but you're also now getting on the plane with these guys. To me, yeah. I think there's a fine line where your professionalism and your ethics, but also just your you you got to call them like you see them. How do you how do you do that without being too much of a homer or being too not too much of a homer? Where where how do you draw that line and how have you adapted to that? Well, well, first of all, if you're in New York and you're a homer, you'll get crushed. Exactly. You can't yeah. be a. You know, this is different than any other city in, in the country in that regard, I think. I think other cities are like that, too, but there's a lot of cities where, you you know, they call them by the first. Like, Tommy, by like the Tom, Tommy Heinsohn is just, the, I was in it, Boston it, forever, and he is classic. I mean, he just kills the rap. He's from Union City, but right. you, you think he was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts, but he, him and Johnny Most, when I was at Merrimack College, you talk about homers, bro. Right. But you, right. Got, but you and Chris are like, like, you know, I think off the air, Kenny alluded to it. Kenny, how good are these guys on the air? They're excellent. That, that's one of my questions was how much time do they put into preparation on these games? I know when you're working for a specific team, you kind of get the gist of it pretty quickly, but it feels like you guys put in a lot of time in preparation. Uh, no, that makes me feel good that you say that. Yes, we prepare, but I can't lie to you because Greg has done, has done TV in the past. When you're doing random teams, that you have not heard of, uh, you're doing a Yale versus uh, Harvard game, and you don't know any of the players by sight or by anything about them, Right. Uh, then you, re- you have to go nuts about all those details. When you're doing NBA games, you kind of just constantly re-up, and you're on top of, and you're interested in, so it's a different type of preparation, and if you're a decent guy, and you get to know the coaches well enough, they'll tell you enough what right. to look out for and, sure. and how to be sharp. And then the opposing coaches, turns out as we, and Greg will tell you, tell you this too, Kenny, you go around the NBA now, uh, me and Greg got relationships with a decent amount of guys on <laughs> yeah. a number of staffs that we've kind of grown up with. And they'll, they'll tell you enough, but it's a different type of preparation. But I can't tell you it's, it's not as in labor-intensive as I think preparing sure. for a, a random NCAA game. But it's because it's the same, you have the same team, so you're mm-hmm. telling that story. Yep. And it's pretty much NBA t- players, so you know that. Now you got to know strategy. So you study, and you're on top of it, but it's not quite as detailed. or not, It's a little easier. Uh, I shouldn't say that, but it isn't that hard. Hey, Tim, th- this show is about giving the our listeners the up-close, the real deal. I, I have one question that I bet you somebody listening might ask. When you go on the, do you take the charter flight with the Brooklyn Nets? Yeah, I sit in the last row and I hope that nobody notices me. It's been thirteen years. Now, do you I eat? Did. Do you eat the same food that the player? How does? What's the food like on those planes? And do the players? 
the coaches, the media? Do you all get the same food, or do you have a choice? How does that work, if you don't mind you me asking? You kind of get the same food. You just might not get the first choice of the same food. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? No, oh, you so know. If, K- if KG you know, is done with his cheeseburger, he doesn't let you, you finish the yeah, cheeseburger? Yeah, I'll get it on the way back. I'm like the last seat on the way back where they store the food. <laughs> right. So I right. get some leftovers. <laughs> A little uh, shrimp coming back. No, the food is you – know, that's one of the things you, you got to be a little careful of sure. when you travel. Is that yeah, you really, yeah, yeah. On my first year, I, you, you can, can bulk put, up. You can put some, <laughs> you can, you can you put can some pounds weight. on. What yeah, because there's food a lot of different places, you know. Do you go to the shoot-arounds and to the practices? Are you allowed to? or uh, I go occasionally, but I don't overdo it. Okay. I don't want the coaches – again, we're getting back to the assistant coaches. Right. I don't ever want the assistant coaches thinking – I um, ever want their would want their job because I right, don't, right? And I don't want them to think I care. You know, I'm so into it that I'm drawing up X's and O's, and yeah. you know, you should do this on this play, right? And they'll look at me like, get away from Relax. me! I saw your your way. You have four sixteen winning percentage in college. Get away from me, pal! <laughs> um, and, and, yeah. and you know, I don't, I don't need. Um, yeah, I, so I don't want to lose because, again, getting back to what Kenny said about preparation, I need those certain nuggets every night from them that make it a good broadcast yep. that I can't afford to think I'm Joe Coach in front of them and sure. not and ruin a, ruin a relationship. Exactly. You know? In regards to Jason Kidd, and you're doing the radio, and obviously you're around and you kind of get vibes of what's going on. Was that a complete – Shock to you, or not surprised, or what? What, what are your general feelings on what, what happened with the Jason Kidd situation in Brooklyn? I, I was completely shocked. I mean, I, I think yeah. a lot of people. I yeah, think exactly. people that I don't go to work there every day. Right. I think people that went there every day said there was a little bit of tension. Right. But nobody saw that coming. And I think if things didn't transpire, like I think Jason Kidd knew in the back of his po- back pocket, he knew that right. uh, the new owner for the Milwaukee Bucks was guy? from was his financial guy that already had probably told him, listen, worst case scenario, you're with me. Sure. You know? Yeah. And so why don't you why don't you roll the dice to improve your situation or whatever right. whatever your reasoning is. Exactly. And boy, you know, like anybody anywhere, anytime, everybody's replaceable and every and you never know. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can, and, and 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 I think the Nets just said, Hey, no, nah, that's not the direction we're going or, right. or what we what we're feeling right now. Sure. And uh, getting back to the original question, yes, I think a lot of people were shocked They're and shocked. so was I. Bouncing it back to the NEC, people, hopefully on our website, there's a picture, and, and it's a pretty good one, actually, of myself, Capper, Mustafa Jones, and uh, you did a tremendous job with all of the teams. What's your sense of the NEC and having our, you know, Kenny, we went over on Tuesday and we had our social media day right in the Barclay Center. Um, what's what's your sense of the NEC when you were there compared to now, how much it's grown and the excitement and so forth and so on, uh, Tim? Well, well, I think I think events like the other day show what what, what has gone on in the Northeast Conference. I, I, I think there is, uh, you know, uh, Noreen, uh, Commissioner Ron Ratner, uh, they do an unbelievable job. And at the Barclays Center, everything is on uh, the front row, NEC front row. I don't know if fans get that, but. Yeah, no, no, we had a lot of people. My brother out in Sacramento, who absolutely loves you, uh, you, 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 you've helped him out, but, but he's on Twitter, and I, I think we had almost 1,200 people from Fairleigh Dickinson uh, and the rest of the teams watching it live. So we, there, there's a, it's kind of an underculture of, of fans that, that, that are really into the NEC, and that NEC front row is really really special and Ronnie Ratner and Noreen do a great job with it. Uh, and no, I think uh, and you add, you add some the, the cachet to it, Tim, to be honest with you. No, well, for the, you know, the certain TV games that they can repeat and they can put them up there, but I think it's a wonderful tool for every sport in the league. And I think it's, I don't think other leagues do this, or I know the right. Northeast Conference was the first. Sure. Imagine having, you know, I got young children, so do you. Imagine yep. they're going to play lacrosse at another school you can watch that game no exactly it's That's huge unbelievable. it's big time it's it really and, is and, so, and, and and well in some of the games they don't even have announcers big deal doesn't yeah. matter you don't need that y- yeah. i want to be able to see my son or daughter or my friend or watch the level of play if sure. i'm a young athlete to say could i ever play there could i play soccer 
at Sacred Heart. Could I play this sport here? It has every sport across the board. I think it. I think that is an impressive thing. I think the TV level of TV we do is very, very. I think Dave Popkin, Paul Dettino, I uh, think no, these yep. people are exceptional, and, and Terry O'Connor, Joe DeSantis do a great job. Everybody, I, I think we do a good job there. I think the setup is there. I think everything is there uh, to really represent um, the conference uh, favorably and, and, and really do do a very good job. It has grown. That, this is, it wasn't always how it was. This is a lot of hard work. By well, a lot well of you know what? Our, lot- our show today has grown, and the time is running out. We need to have you back at practice. We need to have you on campus at Fairleigh Dickinson University. You're not, right. a, you're not a beastie, boys, but we're going out with the beastie boys. I like that. Brooklyn's own. Amen. Hey, Tim, I appreciate it. You travel safe. You have a great year. Go to the playoffs and watch the Fairleigh Dickinson Knights go to the conference tournament, and let's win some games together. All right, buddy. Good luck with everything. Tim, Great I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. That was Tim Capture on The Voice. Of the Brooklyn Nets, one of our very own Northeast Conference coach, going large. We're out. Hey, I'm Rick Pitino, the head coach of the University of Louisville. When I'm not coaching the Cardinals, I'm listening to Greg Horrenda's show. Kenny, we got to push this along. We're running out of time. time What's going on? This is what's going on. We're going to add a wrinkle to the show. We're going to have a question of the week. If you email your question to Coach Horrenda at ghorrenda at fdu.edu and you ask the best question, you'll win two tickets to an upcoming Fairleigh Dickinson home game. I didn't know there were prizes involved. Oh, no, there are prizes now. Where's Sean Morrison? Is he, is he <laughs> left, left, the, left the studio? But Sean is donating the tickets from our marketing office. The winner this week is Paul McClare from Westwood. Awesome. His question is, with such a young squad, what role do you think the incoming freshmen like Marcus Towns and transfers like Stefan Jiggetts will have on your team this year, this season? It's a good question. Paul, it's a great question, and I appreciate it. And I wish I had an answer. (laughs) These guys, Paul, we're going to need players to come in and produce. Marcus Towns is a talented, he's a winner. John Calipari said it last week, recruit players from winning programs. Stefan Jiggetts is going to be eligible after exams, the start of second semester. He's going to play the one and the two. Darian Anderson, a freshman from St. John's in Washington, D.C., very talented. His brother played on the Final Four Villanova team, a winner. And we got a local product here, walk-on, maybe a sleeper, Kenny. Mike Schroback from Hasbrook Heights, really, really talented young little kid. I, uh, just to, you Fans, come out. Because, and again, thank you, Paul McClare from Westwood for that great question. You'll win two tickets, but you guys are open to come to any practice. Just email me a request. You come to practice and you can watch. Our first exhibition game against Felician is going to be on November 4th at 7 p.m. at the Rothman Center. That's going to be the first look. If you are lucky enough to be at the Burgundy and Blue, you saw what kind of team we're going to be fast. We're going to fly. We're going to be exciting. We might make some mistakes early, but we're going to be a good basketball team. We're going to be a lot of fun to watch, and we're going to be a hard out for a lot of teams outside of the conference and in the conference as we move forward. This show is over. We are on our way. Route 3, Patterson Plank Road. The K section. Kenny will be there. Great show today. Timmy Capstraw. Question of the week.
Paulie McClare from Westwood. We are officially out. Take off in the blue. Peace. Once I get you up there, where the air.